I'm always amazed by how much we have in the district that other states don't have. Are there lots of things we could be doing better and we're working to do better to support our infants, toddlers, and their families? Absolutely. We recognize that public education is a public good and it benefits us all and we've invested in that. And yet we have not done that before age five. I always tell the students here, if you want to change the world, teach, right? Because you can give back to your community. We haven't sort of seen early childhood as this universal public good. We just really have to do better. Accessibility, affordability, and quality matter. Good child care or early childhood education can change a child's outcome. It can impact whether or not a child has educational success. It can impact the chance of a healthy future. And it can impact the economic viability of a family and a community. In short, changing the way we think about child care by shifting the focus from babysitting to education can change society. But right now, early childhood education is in crisis. Some say broken. But when the problem is examined, it often comes down to simply understanding the challenges and doing better. We know from developmental science, from economics, from neuroscience, that the earliest years, especially the first three years of life, are so important in setting the foundation for the rest of life's outcomes. Yet that's when we invest the least in this country. There were some studies that were done a long time ago. As they followed the children over time, they saw a number of other benefits. For example, higher rates of high school graduation, higher rates of employment, less involvement with the criminal justice system, and less symptoms of depression and chronic illness. So there's all sorts of ways that everyone benefits from children participating in high quality early childhood programs. Oh, there's another color. Right now, you know, we spend $3 billion a year on Alzheimer's research. We're not spending $3 billion a year on early childhood development and understanding the neurobiology of the resiliency around early childhood. More funding would make a difference. The speed bump seems to be the current mental model. The child care is not worthy of the additional investment. But neurobiology tells us it's crucial to invest in child development. 90% of a child's brain is developed between birth and age five. We know what's at stake. If we don't fix the systemic issues, society will suffer. We don't think of K through 12 education as a handout to families. We think of it as an investment in the future. And yet, before they turn five, we think of it as social welfare. It's not the way that we should think about early childhood policy. Do you want to wave to the other car? However costly it is to support young children and families during this critical time, it is even more expensive to not support them. So it's either we pay now or we pay more later. And if we prioritize the children and the families, then that investment will come. Although Washington, D.C. is a leader as far as advances in early childhood education, there are systemic issues that often mean trouble can be lurking just around the corner. I think you have to assume five years from now, we're still going to be just rolling along and you've got to have some goals and, and some strategic planning. Because the system is so fragile, any breakdown in any component of that, and you're back into survival mode. Anything that upsets that apple cart could be fatal. We just haven't shifted core mental models around the importance of early childhood education for all. We haven't seen early childhood as this universal public good. It's clear there are inequities at play, not just in underserved communities, but in the field of early childhood education itself. The question becomes simple. Why isn't more being done? This is not a one-size-fits-all arena, but we do know that quality childcare can help to level the playing field. And change will only come when the policymakers understand just how big the inequities 
and the needs are. It's clear there is a vast disparity between the haves and have-nots in D.C. When we look in the zero to three space, the, e the equities are just too large for a city that has so much money, so much intellectual capital. It's a huge issue that needs to be addressed and it's a huge opportunity for us to become leaders in this nation. We know that achievement gaps are wide and they've been widening. And we know that poverty is bad for short and long-term outcomes for, for children. When you're in a community that has tremendous needs, stress and anxiety and fear really do kill curiosity. Kids that are in families that are focusing on survival don't have the physiological bandwidth to be able to explore because they're really in a perpetual state of trauma or stress. Survival can take on many forms. At the end of the day, it comes down to being able to provide for one's family. Lower income families often face less access to health care, food insecurity, green spaces for kids to play, transportation. And it doesn't matter if you're a provider or a caretaker. The needs are often the same. The average pay for an early childhood educator I mean, we're talking about making no more, possibly 25,000 in a city. That is a high rent, high housing costs. That's huge. And that is a part of the systemic issue. Hello, waves. If I'm caring for the child and I'm not able, and I'm struggling with food insecurity, am I really gonna be cognitively aware when I come into the program and able to build this baby's brain? If I'm struggling with housing and economic security, you have to eventually see where you have to make things a little bit more equal because if you need us, you have to pay us. Ready, set, go! There's a real correlation with women joining the workforce and needing um, affordable, quality childcare. If you can address children's issues early, whether it be developmental delays, learning disabilities, emotional trauma that they are surviving through, you can have much better outcomes for kids academically and socially. Our childcare system now is a ship that is floating. It's, it's not a sinking ship. The ship is floating, but it's not really uh, moving forward. The childcare crisis is a national one. Although there are bright spots, cities and states are putting initiatives into place to assure better childcare, and they often look to Washington, D.C. as a model. The nation's capital understands that investment in early childhood education produces results. The district is one of the most expensive places in the country for child care. Today, Mayor Muriel Bowser announced $10 million in grants aimed at making daycare more affordable for families. I'm always amazed by how much we have in the district that other states don't have. So we are a very unique jurisdiction in the country and that we are the only jurisdiction in the country that has universal publicly funded preschool for all three and four year olds across a mixed delivery system. Are there lots of things we could be doing better and we're working to do better to support our infants, toddlers and their families? Absolutely. So I would say D.C. does a lot of things well, but just like any situation, there's always room for improvement. And if we want to make sure that our next cohort of leaders, which is our babies and toddlers, are ready for the next phases of their lives, we need to invest in the people who are investing in them, and those are our early learning educators. Washington, D.C. has shown what positive steps can be taken in improving early childhood education from universal pre-K and birth to three legislation to working towards pay equity for childcare workers, the nation's capital has set the standard. But is it enough? The numbers tell the story. Universal pre-K in DC resulted in an increase in preschool enrollment. And there was a 12% increase in low and high income maternal labor force participation. We're well poised to lead the nation in being the first to offer childcare in a way that families want it to, to be offered. I think DC is doing very well when we think about all the public investments that it's made over the last 12 and 13 years. I think that although we've made those public investments, there are certainly some 
room for improvement, most notably around accessibility for families and affordability. DC is doing really well compared to the rest of the country. A lot of states just contribute their minimum match, but in DC we contribute significantly more than that. As a national leader, there's no other examples of a state taking as comprehensive action as we have in the district to support our early educators and really consider them part of our public funding approach to early education. One solution to combat one part of the childcare crisis is to encourage an increase in CDA candidates, which is the Child Development Associate credential in a way that makes going into childcare a viable career, giving educators a pathway to not only enter the field, but to grow in the field. What's that? Having CDA training and a credential allows you to work as an early learning teacher. In Washington, D.C., a number of schools and organizations offer courses to obtain a CDA, and one, American University, received a corporate grant to not only create a partnership with another school, Trinity Washington University, but to focus on the needs of the underserved, particularly in Ward 7 and 8. We were trying to figure out how we could provide more early childhood educators in those specific wards. At the time, we were developing a Child Development Associate credential, which is we call the CDA, which is really a credential for early childhood educator providers. The grant that we've been given is really geared towards Latinx women within Ward 7 8 DC. And so the grant allows them to say, hey, we'll fund you. We'll pay you a scholarship that's going to take care of all of your coursework and even give you transportation. And there's lots of different services that the women are receiving who do earn this scholarship. So that way they can be change agents within their own community and give back in every possible way. Not just change agents, but role models in neighborhoods where representation is always needed. Educating educators is essential in early childhood education. A CDA credential is a first step, but many child care workers go on to pursue associates and bachelor's degrees in early childhood education. Teachers and early educators are required to continue learning about child development, learning about the uniqueness of childhood, learning about how to further help children develop in a way that pushes them on that developmental scale to the next milestone, to the next benchmark. The target for American University is to have 300 new CDA graduates in five years. Sustaining that pipeline is the key to success as is focusing on filling positions in those areas that need help the most. We see in D.C. that not only do we have a shortage of CDA credentialed early childhood providers, but we also have a shortage of credentialed B.A. early childhood providers in schools. And not only do we have a shortage, but we have a shortage of black and brown people in those areas that are credentialed. Increasing the workforce is one solution. The legislation that D.C. has passed is also making a difference. But it's more than just policy that's needed. It's a shift in the way the public and policymakers think at a local, state, and federal level. It's about changing the mental model on a national scale. Because if we change the way we think, we can change the outcome. Comprehensive, high-quality, birth-to-five childcare has been proven to boost IQ, prevent chronic disease and lower health care costs, it can boost earnings and reduce inequality. It's common sense. I think that there has to be a mental shift in the community sort of perception of early learning as a valued career track. Bye-bye. Adios. We have to reset how we regard and value children first and foremost, how we believe and invest in the development of children from infancy throughout their educational trajectories. There you go. Just aim and put the door back on, okay? We need a community mentality that basically says, just because I don't directly benefit from this product, and that product being childcare, my investing in it does give me a benefit because if we can inspire children to learn and to love learning, that stays with them.
I think over time, as we learned more about the signs of child development, as we learn more about the importance of the early years, it feels as if we made a shift. We ideologically shifted to providing more quality early childhood services, but we didn't shift the financing. We've recognized that public education is a public good and it benefits us all, and we've invested in that. And yet we have not done that before age five. Often investment is easier said than done. Making systemic changes requires taking a look back and acknowledging the inequities that have always existed in childcare, whether that inequity is race, gender, or financially based. We've built this industry called childcare through the exploitation of women so that we get cheap labor because all the money that's spent in childcare, very little of it, gets to the people who provide the care themselves. With rent, taxes, insurance, supplies, and all of the costs of running a business, pay inequity is a fact of childcare life. In some ways, I feel very positive that we're really looking at this field and the historical trauma more frequently than we've had before and starting to really acknowledge the racism and the structural inequities that is impacting women of color in this profession and really thinking that we really need to be thoughtful about our structural systems and how we design things. The majority of people who are offering services that support babies and toddlers, whether it's D.C. or anywhere, they're often women and often Latin or black. And they often do not have benefits. That means we need to think differently about how people are getting set up in this field, but also we want to make sure we expand this field and maintain this field. Changing the mental model also requires acknowledging the ever-changing research and brain science that constantly evolves the field of early childhood education. All in all, it makes for a puzzle that advocates and policymakers constantly struggle with. I think brain science has something to offer because we have a lot of different forms of evidence from different kinds of studies that help us really understand children and point us in the direction of what we can do better to let children grow into really competent, intelligent, curious explorers and builders and creators. <laughs> The science has made it clear that the work of early childhood educators is intellectually, emotionally complex work, essential work for human development. What has not caught up yet are the policies and the public financing. Funding early childhood education is a major part of the reset. Labor challenges exist throughout the child care arena. The need for care far outweighs available spaces and it often comes down to pay. Can you show me how you dance? DC has tried to answer that challenge by working towards pay equity for childcare employees. But there is still a shortage that was intensified during the pandemic. We're in a workforce crisis. We do not have the workforce that can sustain the current need right now. We had some struggles before the public pandemic of 2020. Prior to 2020, the district was already short 27,000 infant and toddler seats. I know that the field of education in general is having a hard time finding educators that want to enter this field. Because of that pay scale, they're like, oh, I, I, you know, the cost of living, I can't afford to make under that and, and support myself. Finding teachers is a challenge, and finding male teachers is another one. Most educators would agree that having good role models is key in early childhood education. But men in childcare are a group that is severely underrepresented and history plays a major part in that shortage. Women are supposed to take care of kids. Men are out there earning a family wage. The basic position is that men are the wage earners and women are the caregivers. I think the male standard is to be earners and providers within families and they see that unfortunately they may not grow as much financially within that early childhood education field. I think there is a stigma about who teach early childhood education. I'm very hopeful that we're getting beyond that. I do think it's going to take more intentional recruiting to get men involved. You don't want to get that? I've had this experience in the interview process. The father is like, hmm, are you going to be changing my daughter's diapers? And I'm like, yes, I'm fully qualified to do that. And not only am I fully qualified to do that, I have done it 
in raising three grown children. I think all of us who work in the field of early childhood education wish for more men to be in the field because I think it's really good for children to have a range of role models. Michael Marshall is one of those CDA candidates who feels that he can be a role model. Michael decided that he needed a career change and COVID played a part in his decision. I'm enrolled in the American University Child Development Associate Program, the CDA program. During the whole pandemic, I was looking around to see what my next steps would be. And I realized during the pandemic that a lot of parents had to stop working and that they needed child care. So I decided to apply. What's the scariest thing about being a teacher, you think? I think if we just sit back and say, why aren't more men coming into education? We're going to lose out because there is that stigma that we have to sort of unwind and undo. That stigma is based in history. Child care was more babysitting than early learning. It was not considered a real profession, and salaries were, and are, still low. Salaries are so low that the care of children has always been in the hands of women, and so it is less likely that a family would be pushing their male son to go into this field, right? And then, of course, the pay is abysmal. Even as a teacher, elementary school, you would see a handful of teachers that were male, might be the PE teacher or math or science teacher. I just feel that when it comes to infant and toddler care, there is this sense of that's women's work. But for Michael, the goal is personal. He hopes to bring his passion for early childhood education to underserved communities, which would be a cultural fit home run. I live in Ward 8. And when I found the American Universities program, I liked the fact that there were key things that they would zero in on. And one thing was urban education. Oh, find more books. More books. I think for Ward 8, for me, there's a heavy population of people that, I don't want to say the word marginalized, but let's take it from an equity standpoint. So everybody just can't afford to live. I can't even afford to live in several wards of DC. You got my baby crying, not you. I love that we have some men that's still willing to take the chance. There we go. Because fathers have to know how to be a great dad, how to show that empathy. I really have a passion, I guess, and a, a desire to be a part of that representation. I am excited to be one of the few that can hopefully make a very big impact. I always tell the students here, if you want to change the world, teach, right? Because you can give back to your community. I want to start with family home care, child care. I'm interested in all aspects, but I'm going to take out small pieces at a time to see exactly what's the best fit. Beautiful I just think that all children can learn, they can grow. I could be one of the sparks to help a child to grow and develop into the best person that they can be. So I'm very excited about that. There is a true enthusiasm amongst those who work in early childhood education to fix the issues. And that passion extends to experts and advocates in the field. They all understand that in order to fix the child care crisis, it requires not just a shift in the mindset, but also a meeting of the minds. There has to be a sort of a groupthink with our governmental entities, our private sector, that child care is not just a side business, that it is as integral to the welfare of our communities and neighborhoods as the police and the fire department. I think we've always had political leadership that has cared about young children. I certainly know Mary and Barry put a lot of dollars in child care and really helped develop a number of early childhood programs. Vincent Gray has made that one of his priorities, which has led to the passing of several pieces of legislation that help strengthen not only the quality, but also the quantity of care. Nationally, there are cities and states that are moving forward, making improvements in child care, in many ways using Washington, D.C. as a model. The key is recognizing what affordable, accessible, quality child care means to a society that it is more than just a safe place, an education and a loving environment. 
here in the district, we have gotten to the point where our key decision makers recognize that infants and toddlers are an important part of our early learning system. We are right out there on the leading edge and we're encountering challenges, we're encountering opportunities that other states haven't grappled with yet. And so when we look around for who can we learn from, sometimes it's really hard to find the folks who've already solved the problem we're facing. We need to figure out if it's a priority to make sure that we invest in the early childhood sector, then it should be a priority in figuring out how we make those funds happen. I know that we as a country, we do pick and choose where value goes, and I just wish that we would see that education needs the same amount of value as many other things in this world that is receiving it. Understanding the connection between investment, education, nutrition, and everything else an infant and toddler needs is what will turn a child care crisis into child care success. It's what could lessen food insecurity and crime statistics and could increase graduation numbers and economic mobility. But it takes persistence and sometimes more than a gentle push. We can push for a change in the educational system. It needs to adjust to the standards of what is needed today. And I feel that that's only going to happen where if we all think we need to be change agents for the youth. I think talking about babies and toddlers is easier than talking about adult needs because nobody wants to see a baby or a toddler suffer. I would love to see a world where families are not expected to cover much of their child's early learning experience financially. It would be a public good, it's a public cost. Because if we think about the child development is some of the most critical work that happens in our society. Investment can come, but only when those in the field of early childhood education fully understand that they have a voice. The 3,000 people who work in these classrooms have not raised their voices to say this is important. We are important. I don't even know that they realize how important they are and the significant roles that they play. Unfortunately, policymaking is often driven by what the adults need not by what the children need. And so if you think about what do children need, they need to be in a safe space. They need to be exposed to different materials and different experiences and different books and different people and engaged to help them learn. We want that for every child, every hour of the day. I think the mindset shift is happening. We just now need to set up have the public financing system and the policies both at the federal and local levels, shift to match that. To me, it's very important that we ensure that all children reach their full potential. Are you going to write letters? And that they are afforded every opportunity possible to be all that they can be. We've come a very long way, but we still have a way to go. Our frame has to be around quality programs that impact the economy and economic vitality of the community. And the big thing that I think we're going to have to do in D.C. is to help people understand that the birth to three is much a part of the public good and should be treated the same way as pre-K. I think that's now where we are, is that we really, it did shine a light on a lot of issues and now the big question is, so what are we going to do now that the light has been shown? Now that we see all the lights are on, now what do we do? We really need to be aiming for child care for every family because if our children are okay, then the families will be better off, the communities will be better off. Changing the early childhood landscape will take convincing those not in agreement that accessible, affordable, quality child care is, in every way, common sense and is good for society as a whole. We know too much about the science of child development. We know how all families need some support during this important phase. We know that all our sufferings are interconnected. And so supporting all children benefits all of us. All of our triumphs are interconnected. So making sure that all families have access to stable childcare benefits all of us. We just really have to do better. Okay.